my search to uncover female creativity and what stood in the way of it began 500 years ago in Renaissance Italy, where our modern idea of Western art and the artist was born, and that artist was male. The ideal Italian woman hardly ever left her house, even to shop. So I marvelled at the resourcefulness and bloody-minded nerve of those women who had outflanked convention to make a lasting mark with their art. I think that's the biggest painting by a female artist I've ever seen. By the 18th century, it was Britain that led the world in wealth, industry and innovation. Despite being classed as artistic inferiors, exceptional women grasped the moment to create art, and not just in traditional forms, realising their imagination in entirely novel ways. The 18th century was an era of dynamic technological and economic change, presenting a galaxy of fresh opportunities for canny women to seize. Like the woman who became the first female sculptor in Britain, commissioned by the great and the good. Or the designer whose work revitalised the British silk industry and featured on dresses across the world. Or the history painter collected on these walls who took her art onto the breakfast tables of Britain. While in France, the other great economic power of the 18th century, two women, a portrait painter and a fashion designer, glamorised a queen, immortalising the image of Europe's most glittering court. Female ingenuity, built, decorated, wove and clothed this shiny new world. And this is the story of how they did it. At first glance, though, the female contribution to the image of Georgian Britain seems slight. The architecture and art of this period look like a monument to the talents of men. Palatial houses designed and decorated by architect Robert Adam. Walls gleaming with the oils of Joshua Reynolds and Thomas Gainsborough define the age. But what I see is a landscape shaped and styled by women and blanketed with their work. From tapestry and embroidery to watercolours and miniatures to entire interiors, a world in themselves. But this was art behind closed doors. Amateur art, a word just coming into use to mean someone who practised for love, not payment. But amateurish was not the put down it is today. In this grand setting in rural Wales, a body of amateur work made here at Erthig Hall reveals just how imaginative 18th century women could be. This is one of the most surprising objects I've ever seen created by a female amateur. It's literally fantastic. It's a Chinese pagoda. It's based on a fantasy idea of the East, part of chinoiserie, which was very fashionable in the 1760s and 1770s. It's made of wood on vellum, which is a kind of treated calf skin, and then it's encrusted with mica, which is a ground up mineral, and with mother of pearl and little bits of coloured glass. But in these shivering Chinese bells, I think we can still feel the imagination of the artist. This mix of manual dexterity, architectural knowledge and wild fantasy would be remarkable in any provincial amateur, male or female. But even more surprisingly, the maker wasn't mistress of this house or even an accomplished daughter. She was one of the servants. She was christened Elizabeth Ratcliffe, but known to the family as Betty the Little. 
She dedicated her life to the Yorks, working for them in London and here at Erthig for over 30 years. But Betty was no ordinary servant. Betty Radcliffe was hired by the mistress of the house, Dorothy York, and trained up to be a governess and lady's maid. But remarkably, alongside her tutorial and menial duties, and for 18th century servants, these were demanding, Radcliffe developed an aptitude for art and craft. Doubtless, she inherited her eye for detail from her clockmaker father. Such sublime arty craftiness could have been seen as an absurd affectation in a servant, but for the interest of the young squire, Philip York. So Betty was painfully aware that she owed her opportunity to her master's indulgence, as this deferential letter to him demonstrates. Chester, July the 12th, 1770. Honoured sir, I yesterday received the honour of your letter and will, to the utmost of my power, endeavour to execute what you are pleased to request instead of command. He's commissioning her to produce these models and pictures and pieces of needlework. And in fact, we know from other letters that she fulfilled other commissions for his friends. So he seems to have fostered her artistic endeavor and been very proud of her. And Erwig is still proud of Betty's achievements. Delicate paper cuts and artful silk flowers show off feminine accomplishment. But there's another model that demonstrates the less conventional side of Betty's artistic ambition. This is a model of the ruins of the Temple of the Sun at Palmyra, which is in Syria. It's one of those many sites of excavations and ruins that were being rediscovered in the 18th century, setting off a new wave of neoclassicism. Her version, though, is rather feminised and romanticised because it's dripping these ruins with creepers and plants. So it's as if it's glimpsed in a romantic dream. It has a touch of the fairy tale about it. The family must have been exceedingly proud of it and of her talents because they commissioned a special cabinet from a London cabinet maker to show it off. Why did Betty craft a Syrian temple? The answer lies in the renewed fashion for all things classical, which swept Europe from the 1760s onwards, influencing everything from architecture to wallpaper design. I'd lay money that Betty had seen the architectural plates in a best-selling book about the ruins of Palmyra. So the very latest breakthroughs in aesthetics had percolated down from the lofty realms of the male cultural elite to a servant. But surely this would rankle with everyone else in the house. A servant making temples? Has the world turned upside down? Well, we get some sense from a rather irritated letter from his mother, Dorothy, who, after all, is tasked with running the household. This is in June 1768. Betty the Little is at work for you, but pray, my dear, do not employ her in that way again for one year at least. All her improvements sink in drawing, and then I shall never have service from her and make too fine a lady of her, for so much is said on that occasion that it rather puffs up. I'm struck by the extraordinary scope of Elizabeth Ratcliffe's visual imagination. Amateurism was no disengaged, old-fashioned backwater. It was at the very cutting edge of the tastes and preoccupations of the age. Female handicrafts are ancient. The Bible urged women to use their needles to beautify the home. But the 18th century was the first time manufacturers and retailers spotted a fertile market for the taking. And just like today, 
With a neat box of watercolours or a craft kit, almost anyone with time and spare cash could have a go. I've always been fascinated by this weird and wonderful set of interlocking boxes which have been kept in the store here at the Museum of London. It's probably from the 1790s. It's a bit of a TARDIS of femininity. On the top here, a really exquisite piece of embroidery in chenille. And then you go down through the layers of the box. This layer is celebrating feather work. What women do is take the feathers of one bird and reapply them to create images of others. And then into the next box, this lot have been stuck with artificial ivy leaves. In the corners, we have this sort of chiffon work. And then the final box, here this is cut spangles, which can be bought in leaves. And then you cut it out for yourself and make your pattern and then sew it on. And then sequin spangles, rather like sequins you might still buy today. Cumulatively, I am amazed by the testimony these shrimp pink boxes once gave to the diversity, the fertility and the ingenuity of female crafts. However, public opinion considered a woman's arts and crafts to be for private viewing by friends and family only. They were certainly not to be seen by the general public or sold for money. The world of professional art was still clearly male. And that's what made the opening of the Royal Academy of Arts in London in 1768 such an apparent step forward for women. For the first time, the full range of female creativity was to be displayed and celebrated. The Academy had three goals to put on shows of contemporary art, to protect the professional interests of its members, and thirdly, to offer training. Perhaps the moment for female artists had finally come. But in the stores of the Academy is this famous engraving of its founders. The male members gathered for a life drawing class still looked to me just like a boy's own club. 32 men, two women. The two founding female members, Mary Moser and Angelica Kaufman, they're only here as portraits, not people. Sidelined, the engraving epitomises ambivalent attitudes to female artists in the period. Able to work, but denied equality subject to a different and altogether more demanding set of rules. Initially, the Academy made an open call for art to show at its annual exhibitions. And that did include women's crafts. But within just one year, the type of art that women practised to perfection posed a threat to the prestige of the fledgling institution. I've got here the minutes of the members of the Academy. For the 9th of April, 1770, there's clearly been some internal argy-bargy. Resolved that no needlework, artificial flowers, cut paper, shell work, or any such baubles shall be admitted into the exhibition. What the Royal Academy is doing there in 1770 is institutionalising the boundary between professional and amateur, drawing a sharp line between the largely male world of painting, sculpture and architecture and the overwhelmingly female world of applied art and craft. The Royal Academy's ruling was not a perverse exception. They were reinforcing age-old prejudices. In the hierarchy of art, sculpture and paintings depicting epic events were at the top, needlework at the very bottom. And philosophers like Rousseau knew which category women should confine themselves to. 
At no cost would I want them to learn landscape, even less the human figure. Foliage, fruits, flowers and drapery is all they need to know to create their own embroidery pattern. So what of the only two female artist members? They were thriving. One, flower painter Mary Moser had become a favourite of the Queen, provoking envy in the men when she won a lucrative commission to paint a garden room in the royal villa. The other, who would have an even greater impact, was a Swiss artist, already celebrated across Europe and now living in London, renowned for her talent, sweetness and charm. Her name was Angelica Kaufmann. Kaufman was so well known that she was seen to lend a bit of cachet and glamour to the new Royal Academy and was even asked to paint four ceiling decorations for the Royal Academy Council Chamber, now here in the entrance hall, depicting invention, composition, colour and design. Kaufman scrimped to establish her studio here in Golden Square in London in sufficient style to attract the posh for their portraits. When she was asked by England's premier artist, Sir Joshua Reynolds, to paint his portrait, her reputation seemed assured. But the very fact of her success attracted malicious whispers. Virtually every artist she associated with was rumoured to be in love with her including the eminent Sir Joshua, fueling the suspicion that Angelica owed her career more to flirtation than to talent. Given her prodigious celebrity, though, it's easy to overlook the sheer scale of the challenge she faced. To be truly acclaimed a great, she had to master history painting, the most prestigious genre. But here, she confronted her toughest obstacle. History painting was the most highly rated art in 18th century Europe. That's a classical, biblical or historical scene on a broad canvas. It was supposed to be founded on philosophical understanding and abstract thought things women were believed incapable of. As a French critic scoffed, women's lively imaginations are like mirrors that reflect all and create nothing. To achieve her ambition, Kaufman not only had to overcome such prejudice, she had to find a way out of a catch-22. History paintings were packed with full-length figures in dynamic poses, often scantily clad. A convincing attempt required detailed knowledge of human anatomy, the training of which was something the Royal Academy had been specifically set up to provide, even offering lectures from surgeons. This painting shows the leading anatomist, William Hunter, lecturing artists. They are all male. Propriety barred women from the life drawing class. No 18th century lady could do what I'm doing, gazing at this naked man, never mind drawing him. What was Kaufman to do? Her sketchbook shows how she tackled her modest ignorance of the male body. This is some sort of Roman or Greek hero in his sandals and with a bit of a cape over his arm. His muscles are sharply delineated. He has, you know, the impressive pecs and also this muscle here that footballers like to show off in underwear adverts. But what's missing is the very thing that defines manhood. He's completely smooth in the loins rather like Barbie's Ken. And in a nutshell, this demonstrates the problem that Angelica Kaufman faces. If she can show that she understands the male body, a male genitalia, and has been caught copying it, 
then her reputation would be blown, smashed to smithereens. But on the other hand, without detailed, exact knowledge of the male body in movement, she would never, ever become a great history painter. She's damned if she did, and damned if she didn't. Kaufman was not prepared to risk her reputation and restricted herself to sketching sculptures, a poor second to flesh and blood bodies. But ingeniously, she managed to make a virtue of that necessity. Saltram House in Devon has a unique collection of history paintings which hold the key to how Kaufman tried to overcome the obstacle of anatomy. I'm standing in front of a wall of Kaufman's history paintings. Here we have Penelope taking down the bow of Ulysses. And this painting epitomises one of her favourite strategies, which is focusing on the female heroines of classical and British myth. But when Kaufman chose to depict men as men, she used what is, for me, one of her most ingenious strategies. I'm sure most male painters would have chosen to present Hector out on the battlefield, defending Troy. Instead, Kaufman presents him saying farewell to the lovely Andromache, who's weeping. Don't leave me. Don't make me a widow. Don't make our son an orphan. Perhaps men wanted blood and guts in their history paintings, but ladies preferred something altogether softer and more sentimental for their homes. In this way, Kaufman feminised the genre and changed art history in the process. But her reputation has suffered since because of the weakness of her anatomical knowledge, which the Royal Academy had not helped her rectify. And if painting in the grand manner was difficult, without training in life drawing and other art form, sculpture would surely be impossible. Not quite. In 1784, a sculpture by a woman was accepted for exhibition by the Royal Academy. So how on earth did she manage it? Anne Seymour Damer was unconventional, self-reliant, cosmopolitan and privileged and she drew on all these advantages to take on the ultimate male preserve in art and emerge as the first female sculptor in Britain. The River Thames near Henley is the unlikely home to two of Anne Seymour Damer's public works, although getting a good look at them can be tricky. carved the two keystones on either side of Henley Bridge in 1787. On this side we've got the river god Tame. We can tell he's of the river because of the fishes in his beard and the bulrushes at his temple. On the other side we have his female counterpart Isis. They are easy to miss but they represent the intriguing story of what a woman had to risk and withstand to leave her mark. From the first, fate dealt Anne an unusually promising hand. She was born into a powerful and enlightened family. Her father was a statesman who employed the philosopher David Hume as his secretary. Her aristocratic mother befriended leading artists. As their only child, Anne was lavished with the kind of learned and worldly education normally reserved for men. But her unusual interest in sculpture was only ignited by chance. Out strolling with David Hume, they encountered an Italian boy carrying plaster model figures. Hume stopped to admire the boy's models, but Damer was sneeringly dismissive 
to Hume's annoyance, he chided her, I bet you can't produce anything better. Her pride was then piqued and she was determined to prove him wrong. Resenting the implication, she got hold of tools and a block of marble to demonstrate her skill. Her indulgent parents paid for tuition from practicing sculptors and from an eminent surgeon and anatomist. Anne now had the very knowledge that the Royal Academy denied to women. But her career was barely off the ground before it was derailed by what can best be called an unfortunate marriage. Age 17, Anne was married off to the son of a lord, John Damer. It was not a love match, and the lack of sympathy was confounded by his gross extravagance and massive gambling debts. After seven years, her patience ran out and she separated from him, inviting public censure. But far worse scandal was to come. Two years later, in 1776, in a pub near here in Covent Garden, after a long night's entertainment with four prostitutes and a blind fiddler, John Damer put a pistol to his head and shot himself. Rising from the ashes of scandal, it was in widowhood that Anne Damer's career began to take off. The style she adopted was neoclassicism, as befitted her avid study of Latin and Greek. This is a marble bust of the actress Elizabeth Farron in the guise of the muse of comedy and idyllic poetry, Thalia. So she has a bit of classical drapery over her bosom and she's crowned with a wreath of ivy leaves. So in many ways, this is quite a conventional bust. But remember, it's created by a woman and a formidably educated woman at that. And Dama wants to make sure that point is remembered. So she's chiselled on the side in Greek, Anna Dama of London made me. What she's asserting here is that the substance behind her classical style, that she's a thinker as well as a maker. The bust was praised, but Damer, going on to further works, was now encroaching on the territory of her male contemporaries. And they responded, and not with any generosity. Gossip bubbled about her appearance. One painter, Joseph Farrington, reported in his diary in 1798, the singularities of Mrs. Damer are remarkable. She wears a man's hat and shoes and a jacket also like a man's. Thus she walks about the fields with a hooking stick. He insinuated that her close friendships with women were sapphic. Claire, what is this? So this is a bust of Mary Berry, uh, who was Anne Seymour Damer's great friend and a respected amateur writer in her own right. What's rather lovely about it, though, is on the headband, she's inscribed their names, Maria Berry mm. and Anne Seymour Damer. They seem to have been soulmates mm. together. They write incredibly charged letters to one another, and they certainly seem to have seen each other as their main source of support and emotional comfort. Clearly, there was some passionate attachment between the two of them. You know, whether or not it's a sexual uh, attachment, you know, I suppose, yeah, who I mean, can know? That's the big question in the 18th century. And these rumours originally appear in the press in the 1770s with scurrilous poems saying about how fair Italia's maids have felt the pressure of her hand, the pressure of delight. So, I mean, they're quite full on. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe these accusations about her sexuality are more to do with a deep cultural uncomfortableness with the idea of a professional woman sculptor. The scandal around Damer only grew when in 1789, her skills 
put her in the firing line once again. She accepted a significant commission for the exterior of the Drury Lane Theatre, a statue of the god Apollo. The male body, in public, and ten foot high. Her Apollo no longer exists, but what remains is the scurrilous cartoon it provoked. Dama is depicted carving the naked bottom of her Apollo and wielding her mallet with emasculating force, while prudish classical figures look on, hiding their genitalia, worried for their own manhood. The cartoon was humiliating, but Dama had fought too hard to be dissuaded by mockery. She went on to model national hero Admiral Nelson and even King George III himself. And the Royal Academy showcased 34 of her works over three decades. So Anne Damer stands as one of the few female artists whose work could actually be seen by the 18th century general public. Another one was, of course, Angelica Kaufman, who had already achieved her place on the male-dominated gallery walls, but had ambition that lay way beyond them. She had a shrewd understanding of the new technologies and the untapped markets for art they could open up. A good printmaker herself, Kaufman saw the revolutionary power of reproduction. A single etching or engraving of her work could be printed off in the hundreds, seen in any print shop window on the high street. The marketplace for decorative art was also ripe for the taking. Angelica Kaufman, mass produced in 3D. This decorated porcelain represents the very top end of her merchandising. These are German from Meissen, and this is from Worcester in England. Kaufman struck all sorts of deals, allowing her paintings to be reproduced in prints, but then transferred onto an array of objects from teapots, cups and plates, to fans, to snuff boxes, to pieces of furniture, even to commodes. And in this way, Angelica's imagery reached down to the middle market. As one printer and engraver said of her, the whole world is Angelica mad. Kaufman's ease with industrial design took her art onto the breakfast tables of the polite and commercial classes and made her extremely rich. Manufacturing and trade drove art in new directions. Industry offered fresh possibilities for women to take their art to the world. Textiles were the most vivid and ubiquitous source of colour in 18th century Europe. Not everyone could wear patterned silks, but almost everyone had glimpsed them. While the wealthy bought embroidered silks in huge amounts for their grand homes and their wardrobes, in the industry itself, most women were relegated to the low-paid, low-status roles, spinning and winding. The weavers and designers were typically men, protected by their guilds. But then a woman came along whose sheer talent overcame the prejudices of a male-dominated industry. She is one of the great unsung heroes of British design and she lived and worked here in Spitalfields in East London. Her name is Anna Maria Garthwaite. She defined the English style and clothed her world in cutting edge design and brilliant colour. Garthwaite's moment had come because the British silk industry was being eclipsed by its great rival, France. The male weavers of Spitalfields had not found a way to compete convincingly. I've got here a mere selection of over 800 watercolour designs by Garthwaite. Being able to paint flowers and watercolours, this is a typical female 
polite accomplishment in this period. But to be a designer, you have to understand how to lay out a design with mathematical accuracy. Here she's laid her designs onto squared paper to aid the weaver. On top of that, she has to have an understanding of how a two-dimensional design like this is going to look in a very different material altogether. Just because something looks good as a watercolour, it does not follow that it will look great in textiles. And there are messages on her designs for the weavers. This one has reminders of what the colours must be on the flowers. And this extraordinarily ripe, exotic design has instructions on the bottom. The white in the flowers will be brocade. What's impressive to me about all of this is evidence of the way that Garthwaite used a traditional female talent, watercolour painting of flowers, and translated it into an industrial product. Researching the history of female creativity has its challenges. In this case, there's a great legacy, but the woman herself is an enigma. The very few scraps of evidence about Garthwaite's childhood, a vicar's daughter in Lincolnshire, demonstrates some education in amateur art. Here's a paper cut made when she was just 17. It reveals her flair for working precisely on a minute scale sheer draftsmanship, as well as her keen eye for repeating pattern. When her father died, it seems that Garthwaite was left a small legacy, which she took along with her talent on a wing and a prayer to London. Here Garthwaite set herself up in the heart of the silk weaving district in the East End and got down to work designing watercolour patterns for the weavers of Spitalfields who used them to create some of the most desirable fabrics of the 1730s and 40s. I met with textile curator Claire Brown to discover how Garthwaite became so prominent in a man's world. Claire, Garthwaite was commended for introducing the principles of painting into the loom. Is that just airy flattery or does it have some technical purchase? I think to some extent it reflects what a, a very fine artist she was, but it also may refer to, a, a, for example, a particular technique that she introduced from the French industry, a technique called point rentré. Um, it was a way of feeding lighter and darker shades of colour into each other so that you get a sense of a three-dimensional curved form mm. and it allows you to have the curve in a petal or, or a piece of fruit. Do you think it was hard for her to break in to silk design? Um, curiously, some of her designs have the inscription uh, sent to London before I came down. And of course, they wouldn't necessarily have needed to say they were by a woman. Yes. And so the possibility is that these designs were shown to weavers or mercers. Would you like more where this comes from? And then the weavers or mercers were hooked by this yes. extraordinary talent and carried on patronising her even though she was a woman. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about that, that a male agent might have acted for her. It's possible. It was a very male-dominated business. The, the Weaver's Company was, was all about men. Yeah. It's rather fantastic then, isn't it, that you know, one of their most successful designers was a woman? Yeah, and, and entirely, I think, reflects her extraordinary talent. They knew that they could be confident that she would produce designs they could sell to their most important customers, and that's, that's the crux of it. Garthwaite's designs were not only sported by the fashionable around town, thanks to the British dominance of trade, her fabrics were in demand across Europe and even in America. Here, a Garthwaite silk is proudly worn by Mrs. Charles Willing, a Philadelphia matron, a demonstration of how Garthwaite truly dressed the world. While Garthwaite was revitalising a key British industry, in northern France, a young woman was growing up in obscurity. She would go on to use her imagination to revolutionise the defining industry of the French. 
Her story leads us to the most fabulous court of the 18th century, that of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. Her name was Rose Bertin. Now, you may not have heard of her, but she ingeniously built herself into the world's first celebrity fashion designer. If it wasn't for Bertin, Dior and Chanel would never have existed. And Paris might never have become the undisputed capital of fashion. Yet Bertin's start in life in no way suggested the glittering possibilities to come. Born into an artisan family in Picardy, at nine, Bertin was apprenticed to a dressmaker to learn the mysteries of a trade for centuries the preserve of men. In the late 17th century, bands of intrepid seamstresses broke the male monopoly on dressmaking, earning the right to cut and construct clothes for women and children, establishing their own all-female guilds. Within a century, the canniest had established themselves as flourishing businesswomen, not sweated labour. Adept at predicting aesthetic change and able to capture the zeitgeist in clothes. With women now having the right to dress women, Bertin followed her dream to Paris. An age just 16 charmed her way into a chic fashion emporium. Her inventiveness in trimmings and her ability to attract noble patrons served her well. The female proprietor of the shop invited her into partnership. In 1770, Bertin got financial backing from an aristocratic client to go solo. Rose Bertin's shop was on the Rue Saint-Honoré. She called it Le Grand Magol after a famous diamond a title that was glittering with exoticism and exclusivity. It was made the exterior of marble, faux marble in lemon and lavender. Inside, it was decorated with portraits of her royal clients from all across Europe. Bertin displayed literally hundreds of fully trimmed outfits. So what was her secret? I've come to meet designer Fanny Wilkes, who specialises in recreating historical fashions, to find out just what it was that made Bertin such an innovator. Fanny, you've modelled for us two different kinds of looks, and I can see that this is a formal court mm -hmm. dress, mm -hmm. and this is for more informal, I would think, yes. afternoon wear. What did Rose Bertin do differently? Uh, on a dress like this? What marked her out from her competitors? Uh, she, she finds new models. She mm. finds new shapes, uh, new materials, new colours, uh, new matching mm. uh, between the, all the accessories and uh, the hat. She, it was possible for her to work with dresses like uh, like uh, empty canvas. Yeah. Um, she put a lot of jewels, trims, laces, feathers, a lot of things that make the dress um, much more beautiful. So really she is what we would, might think of as uh, also as a stylist, mm -hmm. in, in the kind of Hollywood yes. sense of a stylist. Yes, yes. Somebody Not only dresses, but the, the world. Yeah, the tout ensemble. But Bertin's ambitions lay beyond just fashioning the nobility. This low-born artisan had set her eyes on impressing a future queen. When the young Austrian princess Marie Antoinette arrived in France in 1770, she was accused of being dowdy. Bertin saw her chance and through one of her aristocratic clients secured an introduction. From that moment, a new collaboration was born. Marie Antoinette's dowdy days were behind her. Fashion and history were set on a new and momentous course. Shortly after they met, Marie Antoinette invited Rose Bertin behind the scenes to her own private apartments. And so it was here, not in the grand formal bedroom, that they had their bi-weekly meetings to design her entire look and to perform the fittings. <laughs> Out of those meetings came the unforgettable image we all know today. 
Bertin dressed Marie Antoinette for her husband's coronation, not in the traditional ceremonial garb, but in the contemporary gallant style, covered in whimsical embroidery and sparkling with sapphires. But it was the towering Bertin poof, a raised coiffure, quite literally built with scaffolding pads and pomade, which truly inflated the Queen's stature, adding three feet to her height. A courtier remarked, to be the most a la mode woman alive seemed to Marie Antoinette the most desirable thing. The young queen had become a walking art installation, and the architect of all this, Rose Bertin, demanded full recognition for her genius. Challenged by her client's husband about the whopping size of her bill, Bertin reportedly brushed him off, comparing herself to a fated male painter and querying whether he was only paid according to the size of his canvas and colours. If his fee was not based on the price of his materials, then why should hers be? Bertin had grasped something that women striving in a creative field had to learn, the importance of the right persona. Was she really that arrogant? We can never know. But clearly, she recognised the signal importance of projecting a memorable personality and titanic self-belief, the prototype of the demanding empress and diva of fashion was born here. But Bertin's creation also changed the course of economic history. What makes all this so important is the fact that Marie Antoinette disposed of her dresses at the end of every season and got a whole new set. So what that means is something akin to the modern fashion cycle was whirring into life. Business boomed. Bertin's designs sped across Europe on the backs of dolls, or Pandoras as they were known. They took prototypes of French fashion to every court from Spain to Russia. Bertin's exuberant confections fed Marie Antoinette's reputation for extravagance. But in the end, it was a simple gown that would surprisingly draw the greatest uproar. In 1783, Bertin dressed the Queen in an informal muslin chemise. It was a sea change in fashion history. All over Europe, women abandoned their stiff, formal silk dresses in favour of lighter, less structured clothes made out of Indian cottons. But to the French public, it looked as if the Queen was displaying her underwear. It was an insult to France itself. The silk industry was up in arms at the betrayal. It's at this point that telling Bertin's story brings me face to face with another female artist who stamped her style on Europe thanks to the patronage of Marie Antoinette. Her name is Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun. Bertin may have dressed the Queen, but it was Lebrun who became the Queen's favourite portrait painter, displaying the monarch and her style to the world. Vigée Lebrun was one of the greatest portrait painters of her generation. But for Joshua Reynolds, she was one of the greatest portrait painters of any generation, surpassing even Van Dyck. This is just one of at least 30 paintings she completed of Marie Antoinette. And it's a beautiful symphony in colour, in grey and pink. It's also masterful in its depiction of texture, from the sheen on the grey silk, the airiness of the lace, and the softness of those feathers. I feel you can touch them. But above all, what she's managed to do is transform a really rather plain queen into a vision of ravishing, radiant, enchanting prettiness. From the outset, Vigée Lebrun had a number of advantages. She was born in Paris, the capital of power, taste and fashion. 
Her artist father mentored her, and as a teenager, she was already painting portraits and had a studio. In return, she supported the family. In 1776, aged 20, she wed an art dealer. She could copy his collection of old masters and naturally he shared his contacts with her, opening up a rich seam of clients. The wife benefited from the husband's business, but the husband recognised a talented asset when he saw one. And one of her assets she traded on mercilessly. In those days, beauty was really an advantage, she wrote in her memoirs. Over her career, she painted 37 self-portraits, convinced they were her most effective calling card. Vijay Lebrun even credited this one with gaining her entry into the prestigious French Academy, aged 28. But she was far more than just a pretty face. She had an inspired ability to read the cultural zeitgeist. In late 18th century France, thanks to Enlightenment philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, good parenting was a hot topic. In the past, the rich had tended to outsource the raising of their children. But Rousseau insisted that women should not shirk their natural role. Vijay Lebrun cleverly reflected and shaped these ideals in a sentimental style of portraiture. And she started with herself and her daughter, Julie. Madonna and child, tender, informal, but for me, a bit too saccharine. She's responding here to Rousseau's call for a return to the maternal, the dutiful and the natural. But rather brilliantly, she's taken the idea of nature and transformed it into fashion. But one maternal portrait challenged Vijay Lebrun's skills to the maximum. In 1787, she accepted a daunting commission to change the nation's perception of its monarchy. The task to present Marie Antoinette not as a flamboyant queen, but as a compassionate mother. With the storm clouds of revolution gathering, this was fundamentally a political portrait. The aim of this uh, huge painting is to save the queen's reputation. So the queen by this point has uh, already developed a reputation for uh, ostentation, excess, and there's a lot of criticism of her finances, isn't yes, there? Yes, absolutely. Because Marie Antoinette was so much uh, hated, yeah. um, the intention here is to make her look simple and serious. Uh, this is why you have the, the jewel casket uh, yeah. at the back, uh, making a reference to a Roman uh, episode. Mm. Uh, it's the story of Cornelia, mother of the Gracchi. Uh, when asked by um, a friend to show her jewels, Cornelia mm. said that her only jewels were her children mm. and she presented her children, mm. which is exactly what uh, Marie Antoinette is doing here. She's putting forward her, her children, her mm. three children. But I think what's also interesting is that it shows that Vijay Lebrun can fulfil a very complicated brief. She really thought about the message that the, that the painting should convey. But given the bankruptcy of royal finances, it would take more than a portrait, however brilliantly executed, to rescue the reputation of the French Queen. Or, for that matter, the two artists who helped create it. Critics saw these women as feeding the Queen's taste for ostentatious luxury, flaunting exquisite excess while the state went bankrupt. When revolution erupted in 1789, the mob attacked Versailles, and their immediate target showed just how much the people hated Rose Bertin. The tapestries and the paintings went untouched. Instead, the mob went straight to Marie Antoinette's wardrobe and tore Bertin's fairy tale creations to shreds. Bertin tried to ride out the storm, 
presenting herself as a citoyenne, gamely selling revolutionary cockades. But her brand was toxic now. She was too closely associated with the frills of the Ancien Regime. Business suffered, and in 1792, she decamped to London. Before she fled, however, she did one last service for her royal client. In the wake of the king's execution, she sent Marie Antoinette a mourning outfit. She wore it day and night for months until her own execution, by which time it hung on her body in tatters. Bertin opened a modest shop in London, hoping to recover her debts, but it came to nothing. Her moment had passed, yet her legacy lives on. She had established Paris as the capital of haute couture, and not even revolutionaries could take that away. For Vigée Lebrun, however, the outcome of the revolution was very different. Bold and ambitious still, she fled Paris for Italy, achieving a level of international success in the courts of Italy and Russia, matched by few men and no other women of the period. Here in Florence, in the famous Vasari Corridor, lined with self-portraits by the great artists of Europe, she is one of only a handful of women permitted to state their claim to posterity. The unrepentant Vigée Lebrun, still painting away, still with that impossible prettiness which masks her grim, gritty determination. And here she is painting Marie Antoinette. She still allied herself with the Ancien Regime and with the woman that made her. There is a contradiction here. Marie Antoinette is the ultimate symbol of elitism, yet she was also an enabler of female talent, in sharp contrast to what was to come. While one might have thought a revolution with a credo of liberty, equality and fraternity would have helped creative women, that wasn't to be. The old academy, open to exceptional women, was replaced by the Institute of France, that barred women artists altogether. It's one of the great ironies that the Ancien Regime was actually more receptive to female creativity than the Republic, because revolutionaries, despite their egalitarian rhetoric, are often invincibly sexist. The story of women and art is no simple onward march to formal recognition. There were setbacks as well as breakthroughs. Back in England, after Mary Moser and Angelica Kaufman, the Royal Academy defaulted to the boys' club it had always wanted to be. It would elect no more female members for another hundred years. But in that century, female artists would emerge who didn't need the sanction of an art establishment. In my next programme, women strike out on unique paths to redefine our idea of art and the role it can play in our lives.